right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on our next Get Think Tanked. Um, if Den Weiskopf, our ETF professor, were here, he would say live at five. Here we are. We have a phenomenal guest today. We're very excited to talk to Denise Scholl of the Rethink Group. Uh, I am Cynthia Murphy, head of research for the ETF Think Tank. Uh, let's do a quick round of introductions. David, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. And then, Denise, please introduce yourself, uh, your business, and we'll take it from there. How's it going, everyone? David Chikansky here, portfolio manager within the Title Financial Group. Um, this is probably the first show I can recall us not having the ETF professor. So, officially structured does not matter for this show at all whatsoever. Denise, that's his little tagline that he starts every show with. So, um, Denise, we're very excited to hear about the show, especially with everything going on in markets. There's a lot of emotions. Um, and, uh, Treasury yields moved up 100 basis points and then collapse. What that does to a trader's psyche is immense. And so we're very excited to learn all things from your area of expertise today. If you could, please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, obviously, I'm Denise. My background is neuroscience and neuroscience of the unconscious first at University of Chicago when actually a guy I was dating, who was a floor trader, like finally persuaded me to get into the trading game. He had tried to get me to come onto the floor and I'm like, I'm not doing that thing you guys do down there. Um, and I thought I was gonna get a PhD, but anyway, then I became a trader, uh, then moved to New York to manage trading desks and sort of, sort of dabbled in psychology still, um, neuroscience and psychology. And then in 2003, a little journal wanted to publish my master's thesis, so I updated it. And a guy named Damasio, a scientist, had shown you have to have emotion to make a decision. And I was like, you got to be kidding. That changes everything about investing in trading psychology that everyone says. And basically, I just started talking about it. And 20 years later, I have a consulting business. Read. I still trade a bit, not like I did back then. Um, there came a point in, I guess it was the fall of 2009, um, where it seemed like I should really focus on this consulting business because there was so much interest in it. And I was invited to write my book, Market Mind Games, that came out in 2012. And so it just took on a life of its own. Honestly, I think because my reflecting of the science with my own trading background it, people related to it. You know, they'd sort of go, I've been trying to control my emotions and it doesn't really work. And I actually sort of use my feelings, but I wouldn't want to tell anybody. And here we are. Well, what's amazing about that, and, and I, I understand the concept of emotions can make us, can lead us astray when it comes to investment decisions, but we are emotional beings. I mean, that whole concept of your gut your, you know, visceral intuition, if you will, or the the idea of do you sleep well at night? All in my mind, those are like emotional reactions to the world around you. So I never really understood how are we expected to completely separate church and state, you know, investment yeah. decisions, money and emotion when even money itself is an emotional thing. So I don't even know where do you begin to unravel that? Well, I, I think you began to unravel it with what I now think is the accurate science of perception. You know, like, I mean, we're always perceiving, right? We're perceiving each other's words now, um, what they mean, like what we look like. Well, I think the best science of perception is being done in Stanford Neuroeconomics, a guy named Brian Knudsen. I mean, it's been done other places, but Brian's the like hotbed of it that says, first of all, we're always predicting. Everything in human perception is a prediction, like even like hot and cold, the things we were taught five senses, you know, growing up in whatever, you know, biology 101 or whatever, um, we're actually predicting based on context. And we're at specifically predicting what anything means to us for our future. So like right now, someone might be listening who has been like, take the emotion out of it. So when I say, they hear me say, you have to use the emotion. They actually experience that a little bit as a threat. Like they're predicting that, that's true. Oh my gosh, I've been doing it wrong. And I don't know how to do that. And my emotions will blame me. And they get scared and like maybe reject what I'm saying, which by the way, that's the problem with disagreements of any sort, that it scares someone as they hear that because it's different than what they already think. But once you get that, that you're always predicting 
what anything means to you in the future. You know, broadly speaking, will I feel good or bad? You know, will this be good for me or bad for me? Basically, everything starts to make sense. And you can solve any problem. And how, how do you, oh, sorry. No, that's right. Ask me, in the, on, I could try to can... helpful emotions and not helpful emotions. As Cynthia mentioned, like, you know, whether it's trading or being a professional athlete, like if you get four hours of sleep the night before, you're probably not going to perform as well. Your emotions are going to be higher. So how do you help people separate like emotions to use and emotions to ignore? Well, I say they're all your senses, feelings, and emotions. Cynthia used the word visceral, like all the forms of visceral physical intelligence. Like your body gives you all kinds of different signals, right? Like this is an aside, but I'll say it. there's a there's studies out of London that show traders who are more interoceptive, and that just means can perceive their internals. Like you can tell your stomach's growling, you know, or your heart's beating fast last longer and make more money over their careers. Why? Because they're more sensitive to the information their body's giving them, you know, just even on a physical level. So the objective is to say, okay, human beings are given information through their bodies, like below their, below their chin. It's not all just up here. And decide that you're going to learn to tell the difference between information that is about the problem you're trying to solve, you know, what's the market going to do or what's the stock going to do or what's the CTF going to do versus information that's about anything else. So I think I've had this conversation at least three times today, all with professional portfolio managers about like a position that's not working. Um, you sort of think you should get out, but you don't really want to get out and you're conflicted and you can set some fear of missing out. You know, if I get out, it'll start to come back. But people think that that's the feeling they're feeling and they don't know what to do about that missing out. It really usually is. And if it comes back, I'll be mad at myself. I'll look stupid either to my boss, to the analyst who worked for me. One client I had was a CIO in Asia has 18 portfolio managers feels like he has to set the best trading example. The other is a 28 year old analyst, like to my boss. So Jennifer Lerner of Harvard, who's done a lot of work on emotions and decision-making, she says you need to learn is the feeling integral to the, whatever decision you're trying to make or incidental. I say information or impulse, intuitive or impulse, intuitive. By the way, there's all kinds of research that shows intuition is a valid form of knowledge. There are all kinds of people who say it's not because of that question, David. How do I tell the difference? But you can decide that all these senses, feelings, emotions you feel have information in them. And you can decide that you're going to learn to work with that internal data set. And you can get better at it. Otherwise, it almost sounds great. like empathy, right? You need to be a, almost like a, a, not just an intelligent human being with quantitative abilities, but like an uh, empathic ability to assess your own being where you are today. Is that fair? Well, that's true. Although you're saying something you don't even realize you're saying, um, the, correct the reason, no, no, it's correct. There's just another piece to it. That's extra correct that you don't even realize you're saying. So what also research shows about trading and being good at predicting price is the parts of the brain that people who are good at predicting price are using are the parts associated with predicting other people and not quantitative analysis. And if you think about it, that is the core skill. Like how, how is the market positioned? How are people going to react? You know, in the hedge fund world, I hear my clients all the time use the term positioning, you know, like, is everybody already short? <laughs> what, you know, or, or what's the pain trade? You know, is everybody long? And then the pain trade is like this, it's going down. Like that's a, those are reflections for where are other people positioned? So empathy is associated with that. This is what it's called theory of mind in psychology. You have a theory of other people's mind. And what the research shows is the more theory of mind you use, the better trader you are. And by the way, trader, investor, from my point of view, like the brain 
making a market decision, first of all, it's the hardest thing for a human brain to do because the uncertainty and ambiguity is unlike, you know, tell me any other field in the world. There's not that uncertainty and ambiguity. And I use the word trader, but it doesn't matter whether you're making one decision a year or one decision a minute. Like it's still, I'm thinking the brain versus the problem. But to your question, David, specifically, I think a lot of my job ends up being like effectively helping people be empathetic to themselves. They'll be like beating themselves up. In fact, the client I just got off the phone with a little bit, well, like sometimes they tend to get a little stubborn and sometimes they tend to hold on to things too long. And I was like, is that really what's happening? Like, let's walk through what really happens to you. Or I had a client today who's only 28 and an analyst like has a book to trade and was talking about how it took him too long to get into a position this week, a position that's working. And was kind of beating himself up, but he talked about how there was no liquidity on on Monday, on the holiday. So I'm like, wait a minute, like you couldn't really get in on, you're saying it's your fault and you were too slow and you took too long, but there was nothing to buy on Monday. So like you can't, and I do a lot of that where I unravel the self-criticism that's causing the person to feel bad about themselves, which, oh, by the way, then causes them to not really know what they feel about the market. That gets, it's all tangled up. And I'm like, let's look at these feelings as information and figure out what's about something else than the, what the price is going to do. You can decide you want to know that and you can get better at it. Any, anybody can, because it's, you're just working with the human perception system the way it actually works. I think it's interesting. It feels like, um, a lot of it centers on a fear of making a mistake, making the wrong decision. And is that um, is that more true in the investing world as opposed to life in general because there's money involved? Or is that, uh, that applies everywhere? We, uh, we are just, I don't know, averse to mistakes. Well, we are generally averse to mistakes, but I think... I never thought of it that way before, but I think you're right. I think it applies in investing and trading more, but I think it's because of the characteristics of the game that it is so uncertain and so ambiguous. You know, I mean, you can basically make a case that anything is going to go up or down from wherever it is at any time, you know, and you can hear two different analysts use the same data point and then decide that that data point means it's going up or down. You know, it's just, it's more ambiguous than anything. And like one example I often use is the weather, you know, like no matter what, it is not going to be 80 degrees here in Park City tomorrow. Like something could happen in the market that's the equivalent change to 30 in snowy and 80 degrees, right? Like, I mean, it's not going to happen, but you know, Pal could come out tomorrow and say it's dropping rates, right? Like for some reason. And the market would go and say that'd be the equivalent of it being 80 here tomorrow. Like there's nothing like from a human perception, judgment, decision making, there's nothing like this environment. So you make a lot more mistakes or the possibility of mistakes. Plus you're judged. You know, it's like a tick by tick assault on your ego. Yep. Like, well- even if you have a long-term, I mean, I have a long only fund that, you know, gets into positions for two or three years, but every day's price action affects them. Maybe not every second, like a, a really short-term trader, but every day's price affects them. So there's just so much more opportunity to be wrong. And it's so clear cut. Oftentimes, I've, my understanding is in a lot of these like multi-manager larger shops, they these PMs that are siloed within a specific sector also only have a 10% downside. And if they did that, they're basically fired unless they're there for two years. So it's like, make 60%, but if you lose 10%, you're out. And that's like the, that's, you know, something that's probably haunting them every single day. So I assume it's those industries that would feel that the most. Well, it starts haunting them at three and a half. I can tell you for a fact. It's three and a half percent loss. Yeah, because then they're like, oh, gosh, if I do that again, I'm seven. Like, you know, and oh, then I'm like, yeah. What are do you feeling? You, 
do you feel you have the only business that's actually recession proof left in America? It's like the second the world blows up, people are going to start calling you. Like, <laughs> I, I can't say I've ever thought that. I mean, I do think I'm lucky. This is a, a very fun, interesting business that I get to have really interesting conversations with people all over the world that it happens to use everything I was ever interested in. So hopefully it's recession proof. I was going to ask you about, about just information. Um, I, in the news business, we always like to say news is local. So, you know, in the, from the concept of perception, our per perception of the world, our perception of ourselves in that world, um, how has that changed when we, in this transformation of information, we've gone from reading the newspaper every day to now there's information everywhere, 24 seven coming from all over the world. Has that impacted how, how we see ourselves in that world and how we are making decisions because news is no longer what's in your backyard. All of a sudden we're exposed to, to the world 24 seven. It's increased people's anxiety levels. Like, am I missing something somewhere? You know, am I missing? I mean, some of these hedge funds, you know, I can't itemize, but like the amount of data they get about either their companies or their industries or the commodity or the fact, you know, like they get in like, just like credit card data, like they do, you know, some of them get weekly credit card data. Like they know like where money's being spent. Uh, which is amazing to me, but so people feel more anxious, you know, they're missing something that could be, because there's so many sources of information, have they factored them all in? That's the thing I hear, you know, or I'll hear people say, I worry too much. Like there's a point at which I have enough information and my gut tells me like what's happening, which is just pattern recognition, by the way, unconscious pattern recognition. Um, but I still feel like I have to like spend two more days thinking about it. I use a quote from the famous investor, Stanley Drucker Miller that I actually didn't hear, but two clients told me he said this, which was, I've learned to put a position on based on my intuition and then do the detailed work. Because if I don't put it on when I have the intuition, I miss it. And if I start to do the detailed work and it doesn't support it, I take the position on and that's a hard, you know, he's got 40 years of experience, right? Um, but I I try to, like, inculcate that into particularly my younger clients that they, you know, they don't have to know every single thing. So that's my, like, I just see more anxiety from that. Yeah. But but it's, uh, it's uh, for me, it's not so clear, the intuition versus impulse line, because it comes to to mind the concept of sleep on it, right? Before making a big decision, just sleep on it. I mean, the whole concept of give it a minute and think this through is the definition of handling an impulse, I think. But how do you know if that's an impulse or like, you know, deep intuition about something? Well, you can learn to tell the difference. Generally speaking, intuition, like if it's true intuition, it's just calm. It's just like recognition. It's like, you know, the feeling like if you're, you know, you're at a sports event and you see somebody you went to high school with. I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Like, you're like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in 20 years or whatever. Like, you know, you just have that sense of recognition. Well, intuition is like that. It's just this calm, like this calm feeling that you know this person. Impulse or anything other than intuition is like, do something, do something, do something. You know, now. People never think to ask me this, but I'm going to tell you the problem with that argument, like a physical, like a car accident, you know, or a skiing accident. Like you look, you see, you go into action because why you have pattern recognition that something needs to be done, but generally things aren't car accidents, right? Generally things are, you're getting information from the market or, you know, about something else. Like, and the reason to take a minute is to figure out how you really feel, not to not act on the, the feelings that are about the problem. And oh, by the way, I'm really just the messenger. I didn't make this up. Like once in 2003, once I quoted Damasio in that paper, we're like, well, okay, this whole, you have to have emotion to make a decision. We need to figure this out. 
So I started going to something called the Society for Neuroeconomics. And I, none of them thought you could make a decision without emotion. This was 2003. There was a summary paper written by a guy from Caltech in 2005 in the Journal of Economic Literature. My husband's a former Fed economist, and he says the Journal of Economic Literature is like the journal that said, you have. it's not enough to know what should be done. You must also feel it. 2005, that's 18 years ago. Does the world know it's not enough to... To know what should be done, you must also feel it. No. So I just went down the rabbit hole. And so then you get Jennifer Lerner saying you've got integral information or incidental, which is, is it about the trade or about anything else? Including, like someone asked me today, how much attention should I pay to my P&L? Some of the senior portfolio managers say, oh, pay no attention to your P&L. And others say you have to manage to your P&L. And I'm like, just let's start with the basic. Is the information about what the market's going to do? Or is it about anything else? And if people decide that they want to know that and put some strategies and tactics in place to get better at it, everybody can get better at it because you're using the system of perception and judgment the way it's built. And it seems like you're very much helping these individuals on an intuitive journey to learn themselves and understand like, a useful and maybe a useless signal that they're receiving from their body. Um, I know it's sports teams, if they could, would have every wearable imaginable on their players. Do you come across uh, clients who work for companies that try to force wearables on them so they know they had a bad night of sleep? Because it seems like I, I, my philosophy is wearables kind of kills intuitiveness. Like you stop mm -hmm. listening to your body and, and you just read the screen. Um, what are your thoughts on like preparedness of a trader with wearables if you come across that is that something you agree with or disagree with in the last hour i had a client say i've gotten addicted to my aura ring yeah. i mean i'm addicted to mine so i have no room to talk um i haven't had anybody have it forced on them that isn't to say you know so i'm sure it's out there um I mean, the research shows if you are sleep deprived, you'll misperceive the risk in the direction of you don't see it. It's a bigger risk than you understand if you're sleep deprived. So, you know, I'm a big fan of, of getting my clients to get more reasonable sleep. So like I'm a big fan of blue blocking glasses at night. So your cortisol drops and you start producing melatonin. Um, but I haven't seen anybody, I haven't seen anybody forced or go crazy with it, you know, which isn't to say it doesn't exist. I mean, the other thing I think people always need to understand, you know, my clients are 80% self-selecting, meaning it's a portfolio manager at some hedge fund that hears about me that says, I, you know, I think that would be useful to me. And they call me up. Maybe they pay me personally. Maybe they get the hedge fund to pay me. So I have a, you know, skewed data set right? Like the people who are, you know, crazy rational, like be rational. I hate the word rational, by the way, but you know, take all the feelings out of it. They don't call me. And so the firms that might force a bunch of wearables on people also might never call me. How would you recommend a, tra a trader who's recognized a series of thoughts in a day to be impulsive, to unwind his logic, to and get it to be a useful indicator for him. How do you change an impulse day to an intuition day? Oh, you, do, you don't change it. You just accept it. And you just go home and come back tomorrow. <laughs> no, you learn to reckon. You just, okay, all these senses, feelings, emotions are information. I'm going to get better at sorting them out. Which, by the way, I think is a little bit like learning to play golf. I mean, it's doable, but there's a you know a lot of difference between if you hold your hand like that or you hold your hand like that, but it's doable. Like, and you decide, and then you start listening to yourself and categorizing things and learn to notice when you have like a, that inkling in your gut that is a, the right information that does, that is an accurate prediction, by the way, because that's what it is. But you practice uh, understanding all the other feelings and figuring out what that prediction is. 
So you realize you're actually predicting that like, if you miss this, you'll look stupid and you know, you're not sure what the implications of looking stupid are. Sometimes it's just that you were raised to be smart and the, the thing you're predicting is a conflict with your self-image and you don't want to deal with a conflict with your self-image. <laughs> um, but within that, like figuring out what your self-image are, meaning what your expectations of yourself are, your impulses are going to come, uh, not completely, but they're going to be heavily influenced by your self-image. And I mean, the trading decision gives you so many opportunities to have something that's in conflict with what you think of yourself or want to think of yourself. I mean, here's one, you know, full-time traders have a tendency to like think if they have a few losing trades in a row, that somehow they've even forgotten how to do this or they've lost the ability. And the number of people that extrapolate to like, and I'm going to lose everything I have and I'm going to lose my spouse and like, I'm not going to have a life. Like it's astonishing, but in a way it's not. If you take the brain science says you're always predicting your future safety, like the brain's just trying to keep you safe. By the way, the best book about this is called seven and a half lessons about the brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. It's a short little book. It says the brain's job is to keep you safe. Now she doesn't quite get emotion like the way the neuroeconomists do, but it's still, she's one who, who will convince you that like, if you don't touch a hot cup of coffee and, and then know it's hot, you predict that it's hot and then you it causes that sensation of hot. Um, but once you realize like your pattern of predictions about yourselves, it gets easier to realize you're doing that while you're making a market decision and just feel it, but not make the decision on it. Like you're able, if you recognize it, whatever, fear, anxiety, anger, disappointment, you name it. If you can recognize it, it's like the old name it to tame it. You can hold that feeling in one hand and then you're much more able to hear your expertise in the form of intuition with the other hand, so to speak. I have a really dumb question, actually, but I was thinking about, I love the concept of visceral intelligence. Uh, we talk about IQ, we talk about EQ, emotional intelligence. So IQ is pretty much measurable. Is visceral intelligence measurable? Like, can you actually be viscerally dumb or... Is everybody, uh, how do you measure that? Or in, does everybody have it? Is it universal? I mean, I, maybe it's a stupid question, but. No, no, it's not a stupid question at all. I mean, I don't think, I don't, ah, you know, certainly there are, there are tests you can take to say your emotional intelligence. A lot of them are just pure self-report. And so, you know, that's a little suspect. Like an intelligence test, you know, you have to actually do things and answer things and your ability to do that is results driven as opposed to you're just talking about yourself. But I can tell you that different people show up with different levels of knowing what they feel. Like I always say, everything I say sums to what am I feeling in life? So like, that's a takeaway, you know, like just aim to know that, but different people show different abilities to do that. So, um, like, yeah, I think everybody can get better at it. Some of that different ability to do it, well, a lot of it's trade, right? Like if you're, as you're growing up, you know, anytime you talk about or express a feeling, you're criticized or you, you know, get in trouble, then you're, first of all, you're not going to talk about it, but oftentimes you might just shove the feelings so deep into your psyche that you don't know you have them. So, like I usually give people an exercise of writing down all the all the words for all the feelings and emotions of investing or trading that they can think of. And some clients will come with a hundred words and some will come with five. And I have people say, I've had someone say to me in the last three months, worry, worry is the only feeling I can come up with. Like they're not, I know, I know they have a lot of, and this person's actually a good trader, they have a crazy background of moving all over the world. And like, I know they learn to read other people and they do sense things. 
and I can get them talking so that they will articulate feelings, but they don't cognitively know they have them. That makes sense. Yeah. Like they can only say, I feel worried, but I can tell sometimes they feel self-doubt or they feel annoyance. I, I can hear other feelings. They just, they don't have the vocabulary. I mean, I'm trying to see some vocabulary. Yeah, which, oh, which is interesting. Sorry, David, I was just going to finish the thought. Um, the The idea of perception and perception of what that will feel like in the future or what that means for your future is so anchored on your baggage from the past. That's why this is so difficult because you have to go back and unravel so much, which may be of your own doing or not of your own doing at all, then come to the recognition phase to then be able to be more aware and productive in the future. I'm sure none of these are the right words for this, but uh, it's uh, it's difficult. You know, over the years, like during the financial crisis, so it would have been like March of 2009 because it was actually the, the day the market turned. I remember this. I was giving a talk at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and I had a guy come up to me afterwards and say like he really appreciated the talk and he was really going to try to put this into practice. And, you know, that was great, right? A year later, I got an email from that guy saying it changed his life. Like some people just hear your predict. And at that point, I wasn't as clear about prediction, but I was clear about emotions as information and sorting them out and trading on the ones that are about the market. He made sense to him. He went off and worked on it. And according to him, changed his life. Um, I think it's so much about what we're taught about perception, judgment, and the way to make a risk decision is just flat out wrong. Like control the emotion, take the emotion out of it, make it all probabilistic. Like you can't do any of those things. So for some people, if they just hear, you know, that the earth is round, like when people started to know the earth is round, they go, oh, now I see how you sail around it. And oh, now I see how to work with myself. So while I have experienced that everybody projects their baggage, so to speak, but you could call that their self-image onto the price because it's a Rorschach blot, right? You can project anything onto the meaning of the market. Like everybody does that. What I also see is that a lot of people make a lot of progress by just deciding like they're going to understand fear of missing out as really fear of future regrets. It's not just the missing the money. It's the feeling stupid. It's the being mad at yourself. It's the what will people think if people are involved. Just knowing that enables them to have a little bit more space to handle a position that's not working more with their market information and less about that prediction. Like, I think so that's the experience. Like a lot of your process is intuitive and get or is i guess connecting people with their intuitive self that self and getting them to recognize signals and emotions coming from themselves but how does that equate to physical movement right because i know a lot of people don't fully understand where they are in space there's a growing field of somatic therapy that's here to help people like separate their physical emotion or their emotions from physical reactions in their body and you ever meet someone who's just like so tied up in their own body and almost like unaware of where they are in space that it's impossible for them to reach that level of intuitiveness without like movement too as crazy as that might sound no no i don't think it's i mean the one thing you know like look we as human beings are effectively cars right like you need the fuel you need the oil you need the tires you need the steering wheel and they, they're all reciprocal right so like we're a body with a brain that takes in signals and we process them and you can get an entry point, you know, through the oil or through the tires or through. So, I mean, people absolutely store information in their bodies and moving can like unlock some of it. So I'm very holistic in that way. I mean, you actually make me think of a couple, you know, I talk to people on the phone most of the time, sometimes on Zoom, but mostly on the phone and they're all over the world. I never think to get, to ask someone to get up and like do 10 jumping jacks, you know, or like go. Get out of your room. I am going to try to do that more. Like I had a client 
I'll give you a good fee. Just give me like 5% in the next six months revenue. <laughs> um, I have a client that I actually, I mean, I've been working with him since the beginning of 2020. He's actually not in hedge funds. He's in finance, but not hedge funds. He's very like, he just was defended against knowing how he felt to the point that I actually took him back to only once a month because it was so hard for me to talk to him because he could never, he just wanted to shoot the shit, frankly, like, sorry, but like, you know, like he didn't really want to talk about. And so it was hard for me. I've taken him back to once a month and now he's talking about how he's feeling. But because he sort of knows, like, if I don't start talking about how I'm doing, she's going to get me up altogether. But like, I should get him to move. I don't know. It'll be hard to get him to move. But I might be able to. I might be able to get him to at least stand up. I should have thought about that before. Anyway. Uh, do, you, do you have, and maybe you can't say this, do you have more hedge fund clients or do you have more ETF clients, uh, like ETF investors or portfolio managers? I definitely have more hedge fund clients. I mean, my primary, the, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the exact number at the moment, but 75% of my clients run a portfolio for a hedge fund, some of which you've heard of, some of which you haven't. I do get my clients then say, oh, when well, you work with my analyst team, you know, I have one very big hedge fund that called me last summer, specifically wanting me to work with a couple of young analysts who had took it, taken a big loss and were having trouble recovering. By the way, the secret to that is to go back to the beginning, figure out what you did wrong, how that affected your view of yourself and skip over all the mistakes you made in the middle because you're just acting out what happened the first time. Um, but yeah. They're mostly hedge fund clients. I mean, I have a few professional athletes and I have like a guy who runs a mortgage bank and I've had a Broadway producer and a and a, um, a music producer for Universal Music. I mean, I have a smattering of other people. I had an agent once from CAA. About poker, Whatever. everything you're telling me makes me think that like the poker player is your ideal trader because they're both like intelligent on the quant side, but also like have uh, EQ and have an ability to read the other people at the table. Like you, you sound to me like you're describing poker players. Yeah. I, I had one professional poker player. This has been a long time ago who played on kind of a private poker cir circuit and he'd make a bunch of money and then lose it. But he's like, he really wanted me to help him beat Kevin Hart. <laughs> but the poker, there's, you know, a number of, coaches who've come out of the poker world we haven't pursued it i also will tell people i'll get like to my professional portfolio managers i'll be like think about poker like do you win with the cards you'll go well no actually you don't you know and but that helps them. poker is a leveraged version of it right because like in the market i'm thinking what is everyone else thinking and how are they going to react and at a poker table i'm thinking what is everyone else thinking how are they playing their hands and how are they reading me on my hand, right? Versus like in markets, there isn't that added layer of like, how are they reading me and the right. perception that they have of me? So it's like, I actually think poker is even an added layer of like, like uh, game theory in that essence, because it's also the perception that the rest of the table has on you. Yeah. And, and game theory is really mapping out how do the different theories of mind work together like this person's going to do this and then this person's going to do that like everybody has theory of mind to use the psychology term like predicting other people there's nobody that doesn't have it but can you get better at it like sometimes i just tell people to add like to part of their process like okay really why are other people going to buy this thing that i'm on because you'll come up with some analysis you know that you feel like you're a genius but like why are there people going to pay more than you? You got to add that answer. Yep. So as a company, we did uh, last year, uh, we were part of a seminar about clarity of mind. Uh, we were talking about that before the call, uh, Denise. And, um, you know, I wanted you to go back a little bit to you were talking about the way to overcome a mistake. Like you were talk talking about you made a bad investment decision and you have to focus on that specific point in time and, forget everything else that followed after a consequence. So can you talk a little bit more about that? What does that actually look like, that journey to overcome that mistake that ends up holding you back uh, going forward? Uh, so, 
freaking out. No, people make a mistake, you know, sports or market, you know, you lose the game or you lose a bunch of money. And what you're told to do is put it behind you, right? Get over it, put it behind you, think how good you really are, all these cognitive things. And your brain's going, you really screwed that up and you need to like learn a lesson so you don't do that thing again. And you're going, put it behind me. And your brain's going, no, no, no. I want you to learn the lesson of that. And so your brain wanting you to learn a lesson wins and causes you to like doubt yourself and to make another mistake and then doubt yourself more and then make another mistake. And then people like are like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. But what they don't realize is they have feelings about the first mistake, which usually amount to, I knew better. You know, some form of I knew better. Not always that. Like I have one crazy dramatic story where someone's wife was kidnapped and he was blaming himself, but you know, that wasn't to include I knew better. But usually there's a sort of I knew better. I didn't listen to myself or I did or I didn't get a good I stayed out and partied and didn't get a good sleep, you know, I had to sleep, you know. Um and you need to understand what really caused the first mistake and find the information in the feelings you have about it. Because then your brain becomes satisfied that you've learned the lesson and you don't need to act out the feeling and recreate, like feeling like you did something. Do you feel like you, um, you get a pretty good sense after these sessions with your clients of like how good of a trader they are? I feel like you actually probably have a pretty good perspective on like when they will, like how likely they are to go off tilt, et cetera. Like as a firm approach, you mean like, we want you to assist us in hiring. It seems like you could uh, you could uh, lower some turnover. Like how good you feel your gut is after like ten clients of the session, being like that is a traitor right there. Uh, <laughs> I uh, how do I answer that with not sounding like completely hubristic? I've learned I'm almost always right, but how so not as a trader? I'm just trading. Yeah, I was going to ask you how I am as a trader, but please don't answer that. Yeah, I haven't really talked. <laughs> um, but. But again, that's me doing this for 20 plus years and listening to my own intuition, right? Now, I was trained in psychoanalysis, was trained in neuroscience. I still have a modern psychoanalyst as a mentor that I will talk to about like this or that's going on with the client. I mean, modern psychoanalysts use the feelings they get from the person as valid information. So I've been taught to do that. So clients who, a lot of my clients work with me for a long time, like months and years. They learn to ask me what feeling they're giving me. Like, are they giving me the feeling that they just want to, like a global macro guy who's got this complicated thing about the Japanese yen and blah, 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 blah. You know, like I, there's a one instance from last February that this, this exact thing happened. And I'm just like, he's just trying to, he's like trying to look smart. Like, but that's really not the the guy that heads the Bank of Japan, what he's going to do. Like, it sounds really brilliant, but, you know, there were other times he'd give me the feeling that, like, he was explaining why he had intuition. So, I don't remember exactly what, oh, you asked me about hiring. We do actually have an assessment that hedge funds should use to hire, but we haven't really marketed it. And, like, it's about theory of mind and your ability to know your own feelings. And we've done some correlation with people's p &L. But I with the help from the modern psychoanalysts who spent a lot of years learning to use their own feelings, I've learned to be able to do that as clients uh, itemize their rationale for a trade. Like, are they just trying to make up for the loss they took? Or do they, I will say to people, what do you honestly, you know, deep down in your gut, really, really, really think? So last year in April, I had a team I did a team thing on a Friday afternoon. I told them to ask themselves that and then to say, what do I want and what do I fear? We did that in real time and they realized they were short a bunch of things that they wanted to go down, that they thought were going to go down sometime like between April and October. They didn't actually think they were going to go down in April, like with the earnings announcement. So they got out and it's they said it saved them $20 million. But... Like if the, the clue to asking yourself, what do I really, really, really think is you have to 
be willing to listen to the answer. Like you have to go. I want it to work. I told people why this should work. And you don't, you know, you don't want that information, right? You don't want to have to face that you made a mistake. But if you have the courage to, you'll oftentimes get out of things, you know, and won't be stuck saying, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I didn't listen to myself. I'm writing that down. What do I really, really, really think? <laughs> and have the courage to listen. Now, if you don't know, like if your body doesn't deliver you the answer, like just wait. Like a, a clue in all of this is just being willing to hear yourself. Do you think uh, that there is, is there a generational component here? I was reading uh, earlier today, actually, a post from a friend of mine and, and the statement was, this new generation doesn't want a financial advisor, they want a life coach. So there's a lot of movement in this concept of, you know, the younger crowd coming up are more in tune with themselves, with their needs. They see money as just one part of a whole life. It's no longer this compartment in their life portfolio in a way. Is that, uh, is there really a generational movement here towards, uh, towards this awareness of, you know, behavioral finance or, you know, neuro sciences and, and, and all of that, or is it just, you know, the usual, oh, those kids, they do everything different and, it's always the same. Like, I, I never know. Like, is it for real different or perceived? I don't, I don't think I know. I don't, you know, I don't, I mean. What about exposure to social media? Like in that context, does that make you potentially more emotionally intelligent? Getting exposed to that as a young individual, or does that make you less likely to understand your own impulses and senses? You know, I had, like, I, I just literally off the top of my head, I can think of three clients I have that are under 30. And they've run the gamut. One is extraordinarily emotionally aware, but I've been working with him since he was 2018 and he was not going to be the professional soccer player he should have been because he busted his knee out for the third time. And he's also crazy intelligent. Two others are 28 run portfolio, small portfolios, you know, they're like senior analysts. Ones. One of them's from this country, one's not. The one not from this country is the one you would think would, wouldn't would know an emotion if it hit him, is much more articulate about like his predictions. But I base I, I don't think I have a big enough data set and I don't really know. Sorry. No, that makes no. As we, uh, we wanted to ask you before we wrap it up, Denise, about billions, just because we got to go there. But before we go there, uh, since it's January and I'm sure, you know, people are goal setting for the year, we're all sitting on these macro panels and it's all about doomsday predictions for the year. A lot of fear about markets, a lot of concern about how I position here, like any, any thoughts or advice on how to go about setting goals that are productive, constructive, uh, in terms of allocation, in terms of life decisions, in terms of even making better decisions, like any takeaways we can offer here? <laughs> That's a big question. I, I mean, I have a, I'll try to do this really quickly. I have a goal setting framework that I learned at IBM back when IBM was a big fancy corporate, you know, that went goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. And the goal is meant to be like a concept, something that's important to you that you want. And then you break that down into objectives, which are like things that are measurable. If, if you got all the objectives that you'd reach the goal. And then the, for each objective, you're like, what's my strategy to like accomplish that thing, which is also conceptual strat. And then like, okay, if I'm going to implement that strategy, like, let's say you're going to implement a strategy of, um, knowing what you're feeling and why, like, what am I actually going to do? Like. How am I going to learn to do that? And then you have a list of to-dos. Those are the tactics. So I do that with people. And then to, to, if you do it right, it's very hard work. But like if you do it right, all the tactics will implement the strategy. All the strategies will cause you to reach the objective. And all the objectives will cause you to reach your goal. I will say this. Dollar goals are really, really, really tricky. Like I basically think they never really work. 
because the market's like the ocean and you want to be sailing when the wave or start sailing or surfing when the waves are coming and not when they're not. And you don't know what that's going to be. So if you have a dollar goal for, I don't care, a year, a quarter, a month, a week, a day, you're not in the game of the, of the winds and the waves. So maybe you're like, I want to be, you know, I want to be a better surfer of the markets. I want to be active when my strategy is working and not when it's not. Okay, then how do you do that? As sort of examples of, I hope that helped. And that's a big question, and, you know. Yeah, no, I, I love the insight that dollar goals are not realistic. I always tell that to my husband, but he thinks it's my fault somehow <laughs> that we never reach the right dollar goal. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's one thing I want to save, you know, whatever, $1,000 a month. Okay, but I mean, like, when it comes to trading and investing, it's just, I don't care if people do it knowing they're doing it as like training wheels. But it it keeps you in the market when you shouldn't be and um, not really like maximally trading when you should be. I had a client once from Goldman Sachs. He'd been there 15 years. He'd just gotten promoted. Or I, I, well, at some point, he, he was a managing director. I don't remember where that. He, but in any event, he told me all I ever, he called me up and said, all I ever tried to do is break even. I'm like, he said, if I just, every day I try to break even, he goes, I am going to know when the market's really starting to move and I'm going to be able to get really big when the market's actually doing something and I'm going to make my year in two or three different periods during the year. And I watched him do that. I worked for him for like maybe a year and a half. Like I've always thought that was me. He's the only person I've ever heard say that. Look, I'm basically going to stay afloat till the wave comes. That sounds like an exercise in benchmarking, really. Like uh, constantly resetting the benchmark until something really <laughs> interesting. So Denise, we, we're wrapping up on the hour. Um, I want to uh, give you a chance to tell us where to see more of your work, uh, read your picture book. I mean, there's so much here to unravel. And I would love for you to go there yet again and tell us about your experience with the show Billions. I know it was a really cool thing, a great claim to fame, but I know you have mixed feelings about the experience. So so tell us about that that episode in your life. Okay. So first, where to find me? I mean, I'm on Twitter is Denise K, my middle initial shawl. Um, my company is The Rethink Group. It's the therethinkgroup.net. Um, the most interesting thing we have on there, I'm not like the kind of person to do this, but I did build an e-learning course that's relatively accessible that goes through all this. It starts with like, what do you believe about markets and how do markets make sense to you? Like figure that out and then work with that. Um, Billions. <laughs> Andrew Ross Sorkin, he, I had been on CNBC on Squawk Box and talked about fear of future regret, by the way. That, that was the most important thing. And he called me out. Well, actually, he emailed me and said, hey, would you do me a favor? And I'm like, okay, what? <laughs> and he said, I'm working on this drama and like the actress wants to talk to somebody like in your role. And I had no idea. That was a bait and switch. Um, before I knew it, I was in the writer's room with Brian Koppelman and David Levian, who were the showrunners. And Maggie was not even there. Um, I ended up telling Brian that my book, Market Mind Games, which is also available on Amazon, um, was written as a fictional story. And Brian, who's the showrunner for Billions, got extraordinarily upset. Like, I had no idea what's going on. He literally said, I don't understand. How could a trading psychology be written as a fictional story? And I'm like, uh, well, what, you know, three or four years of ex interaction with them. If, if they had drawn from a fictional story, their risk of copyright infringement was higher. I didn't know any of that at the time. And as it turns out, what came to be clear is that Sorkin had drawn on my book to develop Wendy. She's from Ohio and from Ohio. Her first words in, this, in the series are my first words. I play myself in the book. Her first words are my first words, like the very first episode. So that's why Brian knew that. And then he was like, and he even sued for copyright for rounders, speaking of, of poker. Um, that ended up me being blacklisted off CNBC. They made a deal. Andrew and Brian agreed I would never be on television because they didn't want anybody to know about me. And basically, as the series and the show went on and more and more people would say it was me, I finally decided to fight back. I sued them for copyright. 
you know, you can say this is sour grapes, but it was corrupt. There was a student of one of their lawyers working for the judge. Like that's that was down. So I lost, but I've always been like, you know, I know they took dialogue from my book. Lots of other people recognized it. Um, and how do I help a portfolio manager trade, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or help Lindsay Jacob Ellis win gold medals at the Olympics if I don't have the guts to stand up for myself? Huh. So that was the thing that caused me to file. If I, I don't know, you know, I didn't have, I thought I could go to court and get a fair hearing. No one would have had a chance. And, and Jeffrey Grossman sued them for rounders, didn't win. As it turns out, there's a whole long litany of this particular judge and copyright suits and certain lawyers in New York. Um, but I try. <laughs> um, you were designing a multi-manager edge fund. What would you do different than what people are doing today? Like, what have you learned that? Oh, I'd make people feel, I'd make them feel way safer. Yep. Like what these people don't realize is they're creating so much anxiety that they're raising the chances of failure. They rationalize, they go through portfolio managers relatively quickly um, and they don't care. They've figured out, you know, you get one out of 10 that kills it, like, you know, it's okay, but it doesn't need to be that way. Like if you made, if you helped people really understand perception and judgment and you helped how people navigate risk, if they felt safer, like they didn't, you know, have that 10% and they get to three and a half and they start worrying about it, or they felt like it was okay to leave the office for two or three hours during the middle of the day to get their thoughts together or get a nap or get a workout, like they're going to make better risk decisions and they make better risks, they're going to make more money. Well, yeah, that, but I, I expect that to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Something very intuitive about that. Denise, top of the hour. Thank you so much. For now, we could talk to you for hours. Phenomenal conversation. Everyone check out the rethinkgroup.net. Um, great work. Uh, inspirational, really. Lots to think about here. We appreciate the time and uh, hope to cross paths again soon. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Thank you so much. Yep. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye.